Welcome to the planning board meeting of July 17th, 2023. The meeting will be held remotely with adequate alternative means of public asset access in accordance with bill number 58 of the 193rd general court, which extended the governor's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, MGL 30A chapter 20 until March 31st, 2025. I tried to do it without taking a breath. Hey, Pete. Hi. <laughs> Thanks. So I'm late. Uh, no, 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 you're not late. Okay, so um, let's see, call to order. Meeting attendees should mute phones, uh, numbers, no, oh, yeah, I don't think we have any meeting attendees. Okay, six for landlines, unless asking questions, commenting, all attendees should wait to speak until other participants are finished. Um, you know, the basic code of conduct, let's see. Speak one at a time, follow Deerfield Code of Conduct, respectful, considerate, courteous, concise, and recognized by the chair. When we start the meeting, you know, you can just address questions to Peggy since she's basically running this meeting. Um, so I'm gonna start identifying board members in attendance. So um, Andrea Leibson here, Kathy Watroba. Kathy Watroba here. Here, Annalie Wolfcall. Present. Okay, Denise Mason here. So we have a quorum. We're just waiting for a few others. Um, let's see. Okay, so we're going to be re reviewing the FERCOG draft of Chapter 179. We do have Bob and we have Pete on. So I asked um, if we can have Bob and Pete go first. They don't have to sit through the entire meeting. So Bob, are you there? Bob? Bob's not there. You lose your turn. We'll go with Pete. No, I'm here. You are. Okay. I, just, I was out of the room for a second, but I'm here now. That's okay, Bob, because we're going to put you at the bottom of the list. So. Yeah, I don't want to be at the bottom of the list. I'm hungry. Okay, so am I. Okay, great. Okay, thanks, Bob. So, um, Bob and Pete, you've met Peggy before, so, all right. So let's see. So why don't we, uh, and just in case someone else, I know someone else was on, but just in case anyone does come on, there is no public comment tonight. Okay. But I don't, I don't see any public people here. So, all right. So shall we start the meeting? And you're muted, Peggy. Yeah. Okay. So um, why don't we start with lot width? Because hopefully that will go fast and Bob can give us his thoughts and um, then get to uh, dinner, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, it's not the lot width itself that is difficult, Peggy. I, I don't think we've ever actually met, but um, what I have an issue with is under lot width, there's these two footnotes, footnote six and footnote seven. Right. That's very confusing because we, we had an odd shaped lot. So it's hard to explain. However, footnote six says basically boils down to saying the lot has to be a minimum of 50 feet wide. But then footnote seven kind of says if it's not, then you don't count that area towards right. lot area. So that's what I did with a lot. And then we had somebody object and say it wasn't a legal lot because one area wasn't 50 feet deep. Although, you know, even the illustrations in the back of the book show how you do that. You don't count that as area. So yeah. how can we clear that up? So it, that's where I have the biggest issue. I, I mean, these are th this, these examples you have are, are great. I, I actually like also that it addresses a lot depth because we don't even have a description of lot depth. Mm -hmm. um, but in an odd shaped lot, say, you know, where it comes down to a point or something in one area. Yeah. To me, it's still a lot. It just isn't 50 feet at that point. And do we do we throw it away and say it's not 50 feet or do we go with that foot? I think that footnote seven was trying to address that. Um, but it caused guess, a big deal. So. Yeah, I guess the question is, if you adopted one of these simpler definitions, like I, I just went down to the third choice, which has both plot width and depth, um, then when you look at your dimensional schedule that has the minimum lot width, you would just go through this calculation. And I don't, I don't know why, um, what the history is, 
behind subtracting areas that aren't 50 feet. Most communities, at least that I'm familiar with, they just include all the acreage within the lot boundaries, the parcel boundaries. Right. Don't, and, and that seems to be the most confusing thing is how to calculate that, particularly for a very complex shaped parcel. Well, yeah, like this this one that's the pie shaped. I mean, that right. shows, Basically, but, I think that's what it's saying is you got to get the minimum lot depth in the at at the minimum lot width. Right. And then the rest of it's fine, even though it's you know not fifty feet wide. Yeah. So I don't know what sort of the history is. I've seen for like flag lots because some communities allow flag lots where you know the lot width, for example, has to be the same frontage as a lot on the street. Um, and then they may not count the access, you know, the the portion, the, the the skinnier portion that goes into the back lot. Yeah, that that's how they describe that other lot. However, it had 117 feet of frontage. Yeah, which it only required 100, except for that was pie shaped, and so as you entered the frontage, you had to go through what was actually only 32 feet wide. Like, mm -hmm. And that's where it became the issue was it wasn't 50 feet at that point. Right. So the, they actually changed their lot lines and made it 50 feet. But um, so that was another tricky one because if you look at access for driveway access, it said, you know, you have to have a 12 foot driveway and 10 feet either side. So that left you at the 32 feet, which is what they had. Yeah. So I don't think it, I don't consider that a flag lot. Like to me, a flag lot doesn't have enough frontage on the road. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know the history of it, but it was super confusing. May never come up again. However, like my thought is, you know, there's not a lot of cut and dry land necessarily. Um, and there's lots of pieces of property in Deerfield with, where there might be frontage, but it gets narrower and then it opens up into a big lot in the rear. And is that something the town wants to, to have or do they want to not have access to those pieces of land? Well, there's the question, I think. Right. I just <laughs> okay. do the job. I don't really, and it was just very confusing, like the way I interpreted it versus the way other people interpreted it. Yep. So that that's what I was trying to address is to make it. And, and if you had to pick a new lot with, definition were you leaning towards this third alternative i like this yes but um okay. yeah i do like this i mean it's up to the planning board if, if there isn't some compelling reason why it needs to be so complicated and i i haven't heard one yet um right and it seems that if we can pick a a lot with definition or a lot with description that's very clear it has to meet that, but it, you don't have to go through all the calculations of removing the sections, you know, that aren't the minimum lot width. Right. You just have to meet, you know, that lot width based on these calculations. So um, I guess my feeling is that the planning board should propose it. And then if there's some compelling reason why it got so complicated, we can talk about that, but I mean those diagrams. You know, I I needed to yeah, read the, I, I need re, needed to read the footnote and <laughs> look at the diagram. Yeah, I mean, I don't even. <laughs> I I didn't even think the footnote was such a horrible thing. However, there's different like just the way different people interpreted it. I mean, I know it's ultimately my decision, but there was pushback, and I didn't want to you know say it was a legal lot because it's such a confusing definition right that it, it's hard to yeah right. well so, I, I'm I'm in favor of not having things confusing and I agree with you I think it is confusing the way it's presented right because then you end up with you know arguments and sometimes legal bills so oh yeah it costs I think it, it's time much, and money much better for the planning board to adopt 
something that's clear and simple that is easier to implement. Yeah, thank you. T totally agree. I can't imagine anyone would disagree with that. And I just wondered, Rachel, since you've been on the planning board for so many years, can you tell me, I mean, have there been big issues in the past with this? You know, what are your thoughts? Hold on here. Am I on? Yeah. yeah. Um, we, d we did have one flag lot recently. Is that what we're talking about flag lots? Sorry, I had a hard time finding the- Yeah, point. if you're talking about the one on Gramacchi, that's what, what? Yeah, that's what yeah, I'm that, That's about. why we're having this whole discussion. Yeah. I don't see that at, as a- that was that was a not that was called a that wasn't a flag lot shoot uh, that was a spite strip was, yeah <laughs> right but that the way a, the way that that that's why this whole thing came up because of those two footnotes um we did have one actually now that i'm saying that out loud uh because we try not to have them right that it's not the that's the difference is that we try not to have them so much that was, I'm trying to remember. Anyway, it was a long time ago. I remember Max and I had a long conversation about it during the meeting, but not a lot anyway. Sorry, that's my two cents. Okay. Well, I mean, at this point, you know, I mean, does, is anyone, does anyone disagree with having this simpler? Probably not. Anna Lee here. I mean, would those spite strips, they would still be part of the total area considered, wouldn't they be? Well, in this new version, I think you count all that as area, which would, you know, make the lot. Because right, right now, say once you hit the, the point of this triangular lot that wasn't 50 feet wide, then you couldn't count that towards area. So that may make the lot not buildable. I don't know, it's a tough one. It's really up to what the town wants. It was just very confusing to me and I was trying to keep it, make it simpler. Yeah. I think um, we, sh you can propose this and see if there are objections. If people okay. are really concerned about the access strip, I'm gonna call it right. the narrower piece. You usually can just, you know, make it clear that that's not included in the lot acreage calculations. Um, if you're concerned about a very long access strip, um, so I can try and add that type of language. Would we? Um, would you make that clear to say that that access strip has to be a certain minimum width? It would have to be the same as the lot width, because that was kind of the issue before. It. Well, I guess it depends on whether or not you want to allow flag lots. I mean, a lot of right. towns allow flag lots because it's often, if you've already got development along the road, you know, you're just, it's often infill um, right. rather than having a whole new area, you know, uh, developed. So in in this example, um, you know, if we had, if if this was the street, so you had the street, um, if we didn't have that extra footnote about, you know, areas with less lot width, this whole part would be considered the acreage of the parcel. And I don't know why that would necessarily be a problem, right? Right. It's part of the lot. <laughs> it happens to be pointy at the end. So. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's not, this isn't going to be the access down here. So this is probably, you know, if you had a cul-de-sac and a, you might have a lot where it went to the point. Um, yeah, because our, our bylaw is pretty clear that you have to access through the frontage. Right, so you'd still right. have to have the right amount of frontage, that, which that yeah. one did. It just, the frontage was offset from the lot Yeah, because there was a piece of land blocking a straight access right. and when it came in even though i had the right frontage and you access from frontage and had the had enough acreage and everything it just was 32 feet wide and went from a, a point of nothing to 32 feet wide instead of 50. so mm -hmm. even if this is still like the same idea um i guess we got to 
figure that out too. Like, even though it has the right frontage, the lot couldn't be narrower than 50 feet in your access or something like that. Like something just, if that was somehow in a description also. Yeah, well, I think the in the dimensional schedule, it shows where you have to have, you know, a, a minimum lot width. So right. I can look at that and maybe add some language there. Um, yeah, because that, 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 that's you know, where those footnotes are. So. Yeah. I'm looking for it right now, looking through the book here. Yeah, maybe it was just the way, maybe I just had a hard time interpreting it. I think, I think what I'm suggesting is you wouldn't have seven and you would keep six, but six would be the new definition here. Right. Okay. And you would have this new diagram there. Right. And you get rid of seven altogether because that's where it got, I guess. Yeah. That's and you get rid of seven altogether. Right. Because then it makes it clear that you have to have a 50 foot lot width. But, right. but it still wouldn't, I mean, and then if, if it could have some, like maybe under the dimensional table, Or maybe maybe that's in the that might already be in the driveway that you have to have a 50 yeah, foot yeah. access strip from your frontage, right? So like it could your frontage could narrow up less than 50 feet. Yep. Yeah. We can certainly I can I find think, that and reference it, or we can just add it again here. Right. I just think that that you know would kind of keep the the what I think they were trying to accomplish is not allowing it to be narrower than 50, but be in a much less confusing way. Right, okay. Okay, all let's right, try let's, that. let's see what you come up with from that and- Okay. Yeah, I guess that's all I really had to say about it, so. Great. All right, thanks, Bob. I guess you can be excused to go have dinner. I can go have dinner, all right. Well, thank <laughs> you, good to see everybody. Thanks a lot. Right. Bye-bye. Wonderful, okay. All right. I'm going to stop sharing this and I'm going to okay. see if I can get the floodplain bylaw next. All right. Let's see. Did you have a chance to check things out? I think I sent you stuff. Can everyone see the floodplain bylaw? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, Denise, I just unmuted, but no, I did not have a chance to. Uh, okay. I've been uh, battling some flooded basements over the last week or so. <laughs> sorry about that. Oof, <laughs> sorry, we're getting there. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So Deerfield um, bylaw is in pretty good shape, but there are some new state and federal requirements. Um, so you'll see uh, some changes that appear in red um, in order to incorporate some of the new requirements that were put out in this. They have a, like a, a model bylaw that the state put out. And you would need to have this reviewed. Uh, there's a, a floodplain coordinator at the state. Um, so once this is in reasonable shape, we would want to send that along to her for her review and see if she had any additional changes. Um, but one of the big um, requirements is to have all these definitions. Um, so those have gotten pulled into your existing bylaw um, and they want to see all those uh, spelled out. Um, they also have different flood zones that they want incorporated. So I didn't um, take the coastal areas. I just took ones that um, are relevant to inland areas. Um, you had already uh, established your floodplain overlay district in your existing bylaw. Uh, sadly, your floodplain bylaw overlay district map is terribly out of date, 1980, but they are updating it. Um, once that becomes available, you would just simply change this date. Um, but um, these 
maps are, are referenced. These are your firm maps, and those are the only maps that can be used to identify these areas. That's what FEMA and MEMA require. So it's not, some towns wanted to, for example, put, because um, a lot of these maps are paper, they wanted to put like an overlay, a floodplain overlay on their zoning map. Um, but that might be confusing for people because only, only the FEMA firm maps can be used for these purposes. And so that's what um, homeowners and other folks, uh, building inspectors, conservation commissions have to go back to. Peggy, um, can, I, can I just ask where do I find them? Because I know we had um, a floodplain issue and I had a really hard time finding up-to-date maps. Um, well, they're not up to date. That's the problem. They're uh, July 2nd, 1980. Uh, okay. They should be on file with your town clerk. If they're not there, um, please let me know. I can get copies. They are, you can download them from the FEMA website. They have a whole okay, map so the, collection. So those, okay, so there is nothing newer than what is currently on the FEMA website. No, there's nothing newer, sadly. Okay. And okay. Franklin County always seems to be the last ones um, to get maps. And um, they have, they do have the like electronic versions of the paper maps, but they're not like a GIS shape file. So um, yeah, they're yeah. not very um, helpful. Um, yes, that's what I found. <laughs> Uh, but they are updating them, and hopefully they will be done um, in the next couple of years, I hope. Okay. And then okay. once they are, then you would just uh, change the date. Instead of July 2nd, 1980, it would be whatever uh, the new map is. But, um, okay. yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, and so... Section 4304 just talks about um, that this is an overlay district that's superimposed on your other regular zoning districts and that the requirements of this section apply. Um, and then you already had uh, permitted uses, which um, were comparable to the state uh, model bylaw. The one thing I will flag for you and Waitley has asked this, and I don't know that we've gotten a clear answer from the state, but you'll notice that in the permitted uses, it says um, the uses below um, that cause no obstruction to flood shall be permitted provided they do not require, and I added non-agricultural structures because in A, you do have structures. Mm -hmm. um, agricultural structures. I will note that there's a question, which is why you should consult with town council. Um, I think you all know chapter 40A, section three, um, th there's agricultural exemptions. So in the past, um, things like barns or farm related structures um, presumably would have been exempt, but now the state is saying that um, all development, including ag structures such as barns should be subject to this new floodplain overlay district bylaw. So this is what the state is saying. These ag structures should be reviewed, but then we have a chapter 40A exemption. So, <laughs> I'm not an attorney, I'm a planner. Um, right. And so we need to get some guidance from town council about uh, the language here. So so Peggy, I mean, is this saying that we're just talking about any kind of new structures or um, previous structures not grandfathered in and they have to now conform to the new bylaw? No, these are for new structures or if okay. they were adding on okay. to an existing structure. Um, okay. But it just, it would be nice to know the resolution of whether or not the CONCOM should even be looking at a barn that's added because 
typically that's uh, and Pete, you should chime in here. Typically, is my understanding you wouldn't be reviewing that. Is that correct? It was an ag structure under the Wetlands Protection Act. Um, as far as I know, because we ran into this last year, um, and in talking to DEP, that yes, the CONCOM has jurisdiction over any floodplain decisions, whether it's current or add-on or any anything going on, which, um, yeah, there's a, there's a whole lot of issues in the floodplain things that you just went through that I have a lot of questions on, and uh, it's so undetermined, undefined, uh, it really, really needs a lot of work. Yeah. yeah. Pete, as you remember, um, we exempted that guy because he was ag, um, and that was, yeah, that came under three, 310 CMR. He yeah. was exempt because he was agricultural. But there was a, and Casey on that one, it's like the, the question we had is it was agricultural because he said he was going to store agricultural equipment in there. But as we were talking, it was more like lawnmowers and such. So is that when do you define an agricultural use? Um, you know, is it buying a Kubota and putting it in your front yard and never using it? Or what's the equipment that goes in there? Um, and is it a storage of equipment? Is it new or previous? This was going to be in a takedown of an old barn and then build up of a new barn, but on the same foundation. Um, so is that a new structure, a different mm -hmm. structure? And what are they storing in there? And and really going back to the, uh, the FEMA maps, uh, and we've looked at, I've had two or three this year. Uh, I, they're just so outdated. Um, you look at A1. I think that's what your floodplain district is definition as is A and A1 through 30. Uh, a lot of it are just listed in the FEMA maps as undefined. Um, hasn't been determined yet. Um, it's going to be a flood once a year, but hasn't been determined yet. <laughs> so when we look at that and then the other question I have is, so when these the FEMA maps come out, how do the FEMA maps, because there's no great overlay with the mass GIS maps for wetlands and other areas. So how does the FEMA map relate to a, a mass GIS map of the wetlands? Who takes precedence? And can we get a map that actually um, shows everything at once? <laughs> Well, I think once the new maps get released, Pete, then they will be GIS shape files, so you will be able to overlay them. Okay. So, my understanding. Or we're is, still a few years out, though, right? Yeah, we're still a few years out, but at that point, whatever land areas are being shown on those new FEMA maps. Those are all subject to this new this section of uh, the floodplain overlay district bylaw. Yeah, and and, it, and it's really uh, kind of a I got the the book here, but it's late in the in the the wetlands uh, protection act. But it, it does mention that the conservation commission has um, oversight of the floodplain issues as they come up in conjunction with other. Uh, town departments, Board of Health, et cetera, et cetera. And basically it just says that we should communicate with each other, but there's no um, there's no hierarchy of who does what and, and yep. what decisions are made and, and so forth. So well, um, the, actually... the half a dozen times I ran into this over the last couple of years, it's it's been a complete unknown. <laughs> yep. Well, that might actually be reconciled. I just want to go down to the other major change. Um, is that there's a there needs to be a designation of a floodplain administrator. Mm -hmm. and they yeah. are they are the ones that coordinate with the different boards. So you can see the building inspector, highway department, planning board, DBA, CONCOM. Sounds like we should add board of health there. Um, that wasn't actually in the state. Uh, yeah, because sometimes there it's a, it's in a, um, beaver areas, beaver dams, and that's a board of health issue. Really? Okay. Yep. Um, so 
this might help with that coordination um, when you have any type of uh, development proposed in the floodplain overlay district. So depending on your community, it could be uh, the town administrator, it could be a planner, it could be the building inspector or the assistant building inspector. The one requirement is that it has to be a town employee. So I don't know how <laughs> Deerfield wants to approach this, but I think the planning board um, would want to talk with Casey about this um, as a starting point and then have some discussions about um, who would be the floodplain administrator. It, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but is there training or um, licensing or anything of that involved? Or There's just no a training naming? that I know of. Um, yeah. Other than when these applications come in, um, this is all the different responsibilities um, of the floodplain administrator. So yeah, I mean, we, we have had a number of communities ask us to prepare like a application package and like a checklist. And uh, we're hoping to get that uh, going with the next round of DLTA funding. We weren't able to do that this year, but we have asked the state if they have these. Um, you know, examples of an application package with a, a checklist that towns could follow, um, but they don't. Um, <laughs> and their response is, well, you should have been doing this. Um, so I guess maybe other communities that have more development um, have uh, these processes in place. Deerfield actually has um, let me go back up, actually has a permit process, which a lot of the communities do not. So you have the uses and then the special permit procedures. So you actually have procedures um, in your bylaw already, which is good. And these are the requirements that you're supposed to be following. Um, and I don't know if there is an application somewhere, but within 10 days of that occurring and sent to the planning board, they're supposed to share that with the CONCOM Board of Health and Building Inspector. Um, what, uh, what section are we looking at right now? So we're in your or section 4300, which is your floodplain, your existing, uh, let me go up your existing floodplain district section of your zoning bylaws. Yep. Uh, the section I was just referring to. Okay. And is, so, yeah, I will review that. Um, yep, is uh, um, section 4310, special yeah. permit procedures. Thank you. So, and, and I will say it, that some towns have asked if they don't, since they don't didn't have the, a section like this, they have asked the Conservation Commission to do the review because the CONCOM, chances are, is already doing that because it's subject to the Wetlands Protection Act. Um, but Deerfield has already identified the planning board, so I did not propose changing that. Well, we'd be happy to switch it over to the cons <laughs> probably. How about, how about it, Pete? Uh, I, I like a little bit more definition first. Yeah. <laughs> How's that? Okay. And, and some there, math, there was like right? a, there was a, a, uh, an article and, and uh, Peggy's going through it quick, but it just said, you know, we have to get, uh, you have to check with the CONCOM and the planning board and this and that. So you check with them and then what? <laughs> who has jurisdiction who has what say who you check with them it's like okay cool then what so it's a little yeah. bit yeah and, and i i really find it and it's happening like i have to go out in some meetings later in this week on some emergency things with all the floodplain stuff going on we really need some things tightened up on this yeah we do because I, I, you know, there's there's farmland that has been dest destroyed, a lot of farmland, savages, at least a million dollars of damage um, up in Conway, 
I forget the name of the farm. They they're they're yeah. wiped out. Grassroots. It's, 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 some, some roots. Some roots. Yeah. Natural, natural roots. Yeah. 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 It's just awful. So yeah. Well, these are the requirements that the state has put out to make sure that the town is eligible for the National Flood Insurance Program oh. and the property owners are. So these yeah. are things at a minimum that, you know, uh, should be added. So, um, Denise, if you can add to your list of things to discuss with Casey, who should be yes. the community floodplain administrator? I will. And, you know, my recommendation would not be the town administrator. It would be the building inspector or the planner that we have yet to hire. Yeah. So, yeah, I'll, I'll have that. I'll add that to my list. Okay. Um, so, and it sounds like um, Pete agrees that there should be like an application um, prepared for this section and a checklist. And presumably that application would spell out what the different jurisdictions are. Obviously, the Conservation Commission is implementing the Wetlands Protection Act. But according to this, the planning board is implementing the requirements of this part of the zoning bylaws. Mm -hmm. And if there are any conflicts, the two boards are going to need to work together. Um, yeah. Right, because the um, information I got back from DEP last year was that basically in the Wetland Protection Act, there is a responsibility of the CONCOM for floodplain uh, oversight, and we don't have it within, I don't think, I haven't read through this, I'm sorry, but uh, within uh, the way this is um, currently um, stipulated. Mm -hmm. So, B, you should read through this because... I think Denise was suggesting that, you know, you might want to consider having the special permit authority be the conservation commission rather than the planning board. Um, I'll have to read. <laughs> so, so, you know, Pete, you know, maybe what, you know, the cons common planning board could work on this together because, you know, we're yeah. talking about application and checklist. And frankly, I mean, you guys really deal with this a lot more than, you know, it's not like we're trying to push off responsibility onto you, but, you know, it seems to make a little more sense, but we can talk about that. I'd be yeah. happy with the conversation. Yeah, I, I think that'd be great, Denise. And there's, okay. there's other issues that come into, um, to the whole the flooding and, and such so right. yeah yeah That'd once you have a chance to look through that then we can have another conversation okay, okay. yeah right. so it would well, be a, a very easy change right now it just says the planning board shall be and it could be the conservation commission which as i mentioned other communities are are hoping um and encouraging their conservation commissions because as pete pointed out they're already reviewing these areas for under the wetlands protection act so they have a lot of knowledge about these areas. Okay, uh, anything else we should discuss about this floodplain overlay district bylaw? Any other questions? About no, I mean, at this point, you know, maybe not. I mean, you know, since Pete, it's been it's been difficult week <laughs> for for Pete certainly. Um, I think you know after he does that, maybe we can have a conversation and have you know maybe a short meeting with the CONSCOM and the planning board, and do that. I think that might be a good idea. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, okay. Actually, have a CONCOM meeting next Thursday, Denise. If you want to add it to it or whatever, but we can do it separately as well. Well, we could ask right now if I know Annalie has her hand up. Um, does that make sense to people? I know we all love meetings so much. That would be the 27th. Uh, yes. Yep. Would anyone here be able to um, come to the meeting? I mean, we don't necessarily have to make decisions that night. So if people can't make it, we don't necessarily need a quorum. But, you know, I'm certainly I'm happy to attend. And what time is your meeting normally? Uh, starts at six. And and, I haven't seen the agenda yet, so I'll be, be but um, okay. there's a couple of things up there, but it's actually, knock on wood, a slower summer, so. 
Yeah. I was just thinking that, and I, I will add this to the agenda. Okay. Um, is it Zoom or is it hybrid or what? What do you typically uh, Zoom. do? Zoom. Are you doing Zoom? Zoom? Okay. Yeah. That makes it easier. Okay. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah, I think as long as you have, you know, a rep from the planning board, you can have that discussion and then report back. Okay, I'll do that. And you, I'm sorry, you said six o'clock? Yeah, it starts at six. Okay. And um, I'll work with Amy on the um, agenda, but it'll we have to go through a few things. So okay. I don't think it'd be that long, though. All yeah. right. So I'll attend. Oh. If anyone else is able to, just let me know. Annalie, you have your hand up. I just have a question before Pete leaves the meeting. So, but it's unrelated to what we're talking about right now. It's on a different section. Okay. Go ahead. Um, actually, it's a section. If we're are we done with floodplain, Peggy? I think we are, unless anybody okay. else has some comments for me. I think the two outstanding thing is who is going to be the floodplain administrator and whether or not the planning board that's a special permit authority right now will change to the CONCOM. Okay. Pending right. the meeting. So my question, um, Pete, we're, we're proposing a new section to the bylaws that talks about hiring of professional consultants. And we can maybe go over more of that without you there. But at one point it talks about when professional consultants are engaged by the planning board of the ZBA. And I believe that uh, CONCOM also hires peer review and whatnot. So most likely we should include CONCOM in this section. Well, yeah, if they would... to, sorry, to become the special permit granting agency under the floodplain overlay district bylaw, absolutely. Do, but do they have other responsibilities under your zoning bylaws? Because this uh, hiring consultant section is applying to the zoning bylaws. Well, CONCOM, you hire peer review and... Yes, quite often, yeah. Um, for wetland delineations and, you know, uh, site reviews and um, all that kind of thing. But yeah, we do. And we try at times to really coordinate between the board so that one peer reviewer could do a number of different things. But um, our primary look at is um, wetlands and delineation um, issues. But it should be at the end of the yes, yes. I guess what I'm saying, Anna Lee, is that the CONCOM would have their own section in their regulations or there would be a general town bylaw. And I wasn't, it wasn't clear to me um, from Casey, it, it didn't, she wasn't sure whether there was a general bylaw um, that covered all the boards. So it seemed prudent to make sure that this was in the zoning bylaws. So I'm not town council or a, a, an attorney. So I think you would need to talk with um, Casey and, and perhaps town council about where uh, the Con conservation commission's authority for hiring outside consultants lies. Well, and we always reference a certain section and I can't remember right now, but I thought it actually came from the uh, Wetlands Protection Act. Um, it may that, well. It may yeah, well. I thought case. it referred back to there. I'm looking up um, that we have the you know authority and right to do uh, the peer review on on uh, any of the applications and whether it was a, a RDA or a NOI or a NRAD or whatever. I thought it went back to uh, WPA, but I might be wrong. And Peggy, and, and I won't take up more time because I know you guys are so busy, And but uh, for the other people on the planning board, uh, you mentioned like what the bylaws are in Deerfield. And so there are new bylaws for the Conservation Commission. Um, and over the last couple of years, we have developed um, a very standardized list of orders of conditions, mm -hmm. uh, probably about 75 of them that we can pick and choose from so we don't have to rewrite them and keep them standardized. And I don't know whether any of those should be uh, a town bylaw, because we use a lot of them all the time, especially for erosion control and, and different items, or do we still 
maintain what we're doing on each application um, to assess all these um, additional orders of conditions, uh, which we can do um, both on the, uh, yeah, we can do on all of them, but it's kind of almost contradictory on the RDA because you're making a determination of if it's applicable or not. And so if you're making a determination it's applicable or not, then why do you add on, <laughs> you know, orders of conditions? Because well, anyways, um, but I didn't know whether, um, and that would be more for um, the planning board and, and others in, in town to, to think about, do we need any um, bylaws put in place actually um relative to the conservation commission um versus us putting out these lengthy 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 um approvals um with a lot of uh things going on which could have been done up front uh, yeah. if the applicant knew about it so that's all that was just a a general question yeah well i think i think that's a question to have with casey and i i don't know about the select board but definitely with casey because i know that you know our basic town bylaws that, you know, they need to be changed. They need to be worked on, but, you know, one thing at a time. Yeah, right. Yeah. There's, there's a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now we'll just keep putting out our, our orders of conditions and see how it goes. Sounds but, good. Yeah. Great. Okay. Okay. Thanks so much, uh, Pete. And I'll yep. be there next week and hopefully other okay. members may be able to join. Great. We'll talk to okay. you then. Thanks, and everybody. Good, good luck with your basement flooding. So <laughs> I sorry. think we're good. I think we're getting there. <laughs> Ugh. All okay. Right. All right. Thanks, yeah. Pete. Bye. Bye. Okay. Let's so, see. Denise, I should just mention that um, you should just make sure you don't have a quorum at the ConCom meeting. Right. So you need to post it as a joint yes. meeting. So yeah. Just make sure it's one or two of you and not right. <laughs> a quorum. Well, I don't know if people are rushing to join that meeting. You know, if you are, raise your hand. If not, um, Amy, can you just put it as a joint meeting anyway? If you can come, great. If you can't come, don't worry can about I it. Put the date one more time. I... It's the 27th at 6 p.m. and it's only Zoom. 27th at 6 yeah. p.m. and it's mm -hmm. only Zoom. Only Zoom. I can't come, sorry. And That's fine. Thursdays are tough for me, but I might be able to call in for the first 30 yeah. minutes. I mean, if we just put it as a joint meeting, at least we cover our bases in case sure. someone decides, hey, I really want to join this meeting. Okay. So if you could do that, Amy, that would be great. Okay. And, and then, but it's still okay. Uh, obviously, if you don't get a quorum, then you're just yeah. not there and the ConCom meeting goes on. No, it's, it's, um, it's yeah. fine. I mean, I'm just there to, you know, to listen. We can have a conversation, but no decisions will be made anyway. Okay. But thank you. Thank you for reminding Peggy. That's always <laughs> good. <laughs> always good. Okay, so where do you want to go from here? Um, I mean, Casey isn't here, but um, there was the definition of nonprofit event at the end of the bylaws. And okay. she's going to figure out what um, number it was, unless I, someone else knows that. I checked on that. I spoke, I spoke with I spoke with Carolyn today on our select board. And I asked her that. I said, we don't have information. What does that definition, what, what, what does that mean? And she said, basically, it was, it's anything, any nonprofit, for instance, churches, um, the police could be anything in Deerfield, um, could be uh, the Deerfield Craft Fair, anything that is a benefit to the community, we waive the fee okay. for that. And that's basically it. Yes, but it also says and shall require a special permit from the select board pursuant to article blank. It's currently blank. Oh, geez. Okay. So that's I need to fill in what okay. article of the general bylaws. I will find that, that out. Special permit is issued under. Okay. So, thank you. I'll, I'll do that. So to. I missed that part. Definition. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to go through the list of outstanding items and then if we have time we'll go back to the second draft of the zoning mm -hmm. bylaws see if there were any questions about the changes I made um we had talked about flexible development you know should 
that get deleted or get left in. Um, I guess I don't really see harm in leaving it in. And since zoning changes are always touchy, um, <laughs> perhaps uh, given all the other changes, it's best to leave it right now. I understand it hasn't been used, but it's just another tool in the toolbox. So I think for now, I probably leave it in. Um, another simple one is now that hopefully you all had a chance to look at the new, uh, the proposed official zoning map that now has the adult use overlay district on it. Um, there's a black and white old graphic in the back. I'd just like to get rid of that if that's okay with folks. Just adding. I actually showed that to Bob one day, the new map, and he thought it was great. <laughs> awesome. All right. Yeah, I thought it was much better. So I'm just going to get rid of that old graphic. Clean up the bylaws a little bit. Um, and then the other thing that we still had outstanding um, was whether or not in the use table you wanted to cap the size of retail. So we looked at some building size examples, you know, like Big Y in Greenfield and Yankee Candle in Deerfield. Um, so some some communities, if they're concerned about big box retailers, they sometimes put caps on um, the size of retail outfits. But I don't know um, whether Deerfield wants to do that or not, but I just thought I would raise it. So we just need to make a decision. We need well, to make a decision about whether you wanted to propose a cap or not. I think so. Well, we only have one, is it just one district that we can have anything large and that would be the C2 district. Is that right? Ladies, ladies. Okay, okay, sorry. Sorry if I call you ladies, it's, I'm not being disrespectful. <laughs> You know, I, I did this thing. I, I was looking. I was looking that up today, and I found this. It's called the in Institute for Self Reliance, and it has a community protection policy kit, a store store size cap ordinance. And so it um, there's a model ordinance. Oh wait, no wait, no. What is it? So the, the really big one, the sixty thousand. They're even bigger. 60,000 with no cap is just in the planned industrial and in the EPD. The C2 district goes up to 60,000. Okay. So I think the last time we talked about this, people weren't too concerned because there wasn't a lot of room in the planned industrial and there wasn't any room, uh, much room left in the EPD. So I think we kind of thought it might be a moot issue and that but that's not to say that you know there couldn't be redevelopment at some future point but for right, right now it seemed like a unlikely event that you would get another large use in there so well let's hope not but but you know I mean I was looking to see because sometimes it's like it's hard to really think well how big is that store what's the footprint and I think is it saying that um shoot they have a couple different towns in here and it's like Dormiscata, Maine, the, um, it bars stores over 35,000 square feet and the population there is only 1,352 people. <laughs> and a lot of these stores, um, Ashland, Oregon, they bar retail stores no more than 45,000 square feet and their population is 21,000. So I thought oh, that was sort of surprising. So they're really trying to keep it down, but and I like the average Rite Aid store is 13,000 square feet. So, you know, I mean, it gives you frame of reference of how big they are. Best Buy, 37,000 square feet. And a football field is 50,000 square feet, 57,000 square feet. So, yeah. So, I'd I like guess to... the, the question is is the C2, the 60,000 square feet, is that good? I um, yeah, and, and Lee, I mean, I think of square feet, but also sort of cubic feet. We're not considering height here. Well, the height's determined by your dimensional schedule. We buy a lot of So let me just look at that quick. I mean, those stores typically are just one single floor. Right. 
I mean, unless it's, um, I don't know, some department store, which I couldn't imagine being built. So the um, maximum building height in all your districts, except for the EPD is 35 feet, which is like one and a half, maybe two stories. Yeah. And the EPD goes up to 48 feet. So that one allows a taller building. The square foot, the the um, the footprint, or does it refer to the actual floor space? If you, because if it's the actual floor space, then if you put on extra stories, that's adding. If it's just the footprint, yeah, then you've got an issue. Um, so your dimensional schedule has a maximum lot coverage. Okay. So. Um, it would be determined by the size of the building, you know, would be determined by several things. One is the maximum square footage allowed in the use table for retail uses, the maximum height defined by the district it's in, and then the maximum lot coverage that it could cover. Well, I'm just thinking if it's square feet of retail space, then that counts the second and third stories, the potential second story. Yes, presumably if it's usable retail space, if it was on a second story, it would be counting towards that. Okay. That's but you don't yeah. usually see too many retail stores. True. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> With more unless they're, you know, a a larger department store like a Macy's or, you know, sometimes they those have two or three stories, but yeah. Ikea in New Haven has two. Has two, yeah. <laughs> it's highly unlikely that they're going to build anything like that in our C2 district. I mean, I don't, you know, I would be surprised. So. Okay, so we're, we'll leave it for now? Yeah. Okay. Um. And I'd like to hold off on the, talking about public outreach and just go back. Do you want me to pull up the second draft of the bylaws? Are they? You want to go over the uh, consultant thing first? So is that something? Sure. Okay. And I just want to ask um, before we leave the meeting, um, what uh, I emailed about earlier, which is. Um, now suddenly escaping my mind, but I didn't want to uh, pay you the email I sent you earlier today. Yeah. Oh, about the 60 day about yes, our yes. time. Limit. I, I, yeah, I definitely want to get that in just at some point before. Okay. We... Thanks. Um, why don't we discuss that once I get these uh, hold up? Hang on just a sec. Thanks. Oh, All right. Uh, so what Amy was uh, referring to is, I guess, in your site plan review section. And yeah. Let me see if I can it's, scroll it's, down to that. 5445. Yeah. We've got all the participants. There it is. Sorry, hopefully I'm not making you all dizzy. Don't look until I get there. <laughs> Things go whizzing by. Where are we? Oh, I, it's such a pain to navigate these things, and I do it all the time. It makes me crazy. Yeah. Just a little hard when you're doing share screen. Yeah. yeah. All right. I think I. So this is your site plan review section, mm -hmm. um, and if you go down in the procedures. It talks about the application 
um, and then the review by boards, and we're changing the review by boards to 21 uh, days to give them more time. And then it talks about the hearing process. And the hearing process, the decision um, is, is supposed to be made um, within 90 days of the application filing date. Um, site plan review doesn't have a specific section in the zoning bylaws, uh, Chapter 40A of the Zoning Act. So there isn't specific guidance, but it does for special permits. And typically that 90 days is from the, the date of the public hearing or the close of the public hearing. And this one is 90 days from when the application was filed. And so that makes it kind of compressed. If you had a long public hearing process, the planning board may not have a lot of time for writing the decision. Um, so I think Amy's suggestion was why, um, what was the reason for this and would the planning board prefer to have it uh, be running from when the public hearing, yes, which would give you more time to um, prepare your decision and get it filed. I think it makes sense to do it at, you know, at the end of the public hearing, because we're, you know, we're having a public hearing where we're, you know, we may have it, you know, a few months in a row, we may not end it. So that would make it really ridiculous. So to me, it makes sense to have it at the end. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's just sort of a, an administrative nightmare and that you have to get special permission to go beyond. And I just, you know, I, I can't see any good reason to limit us. You know, why would you want to limit the amount of discussion that you have? I mean, obviously, you don't want to drag things out, but it just seems to me you want to make sure you're thorough and why put up roadblocks um, and potentially you know, leave yourself open to having to start the hearing all over again if you didn't get the right permission. Okay, so I can make and that you, change. You suggest 60 days at the end of the public hearing? Not 90. It, it depends. Uh, some towns have a shorter time frame. The special permits, it's, it's 90 days, but if you wanted to do 60 days, you could do that if you, you know, I, yeah, I mean, I would be perfectly happy with 60 from the close. I just, 90 from the start to me is it limits the amount of discussion you have and then it puts me up against the wall if yeah. I'm helping to write the decision and I'm stuck trying to get it out, you know, if you yeah. took a 60 day or, you know. So, yeah, I mean, I have no problem with if, if you start from the end of it being even 45. I mean, I think I can do that. Although I, I guess what? You want to leave yourself open to if you have questions for counsel, I think you want yeah. to leave yourself some time to be able to get your counsel to look at things. Yeah, I think 60 days is is reasonable if you know if you feel like you can get the decision done in that time. It sounds like it would give you more time than what's currently happening. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would greatly appreciate it. Okay. So we'll make that change to the next draft. Great, thank you. All right. <laughs> All right, and Annalie, you wanted to go down to the new section on hiring of consultants. Was that 60 days? I'm sorry, 60 days? 60 no, days, right. yep. Thank Let me get down to this new section. Okay. So rather than renumbering things, I just added this as a new section in your um, administrative part of your bylaws. So it's in the Article 5 administration. Um, and there's a new hiring professional consultants. So if the uh, CONCOM does take on the floodplain overlay district, we would add them here. 
uh, but right now it's the planning board or ZBA. Uh, ZBA does special permits and also I don't know if they ever hire people for variances, but anyhow. And then th these are some of the requirements um, in terms of the state um, having a special account set up uh, to manage these funds and what the reporting requirements are. And then a very general section on the who you can hire. So the list is very broad, professional engineers, planners, landscape architects, well, wildlife scientists, lawyers, designers, other appropriate professionals. There's an appeal process if the applicant is unhappy um, with who the planning board uh, selected. Um, and that's also in accordance with the, the state guidance. Um, so this basically follows what the state requirements are for hiring of outside consultants. Okay. Anna Lee? Yeah, question uh, 5820. Do we need or want any guidelines in terms of the amount of fees? You know, which then ties into the special account. I mean, yeah. I don't know how you would do that because it would really depend on the project that was coming in and what type of consultant you were hiring. So, you know, if it was a very complex project, presumably you would get an estimate from an engineering firm. And then that would be the information you would provide to the applicant about what it would cost for that assistance, right? Because it's at the yeah. applicant's expense. So I yeah, don't that's what I do. yeah, that's what I do. I put out a request for proposals. Um, people get back to me. And then I present them to the applicant. And yeah, I don't see how you could cap that because, you know, a huge, block, you know, sunny days was huge. That was just, you know, and the fee is, uh, you know, as long as it's reasonable as by engineering standards, but I, yeah, I don't see how you could cap it or. Or specify it ahead of time. It really would depend on the project. This is, An this is Andrea. I have a, I have a question about um, the list of expenses that will be borne by the applicant. And I was surprised by the um, term advertising. Um, so if we advertise or have a notice of a public hearing, are we expecting the applicant to pay for that? They do, that's what they do now. That is, that is our procedure, yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'd go back to 5850. It ties into what Amy was just talking about with the actual um, selection of the um, of the consultants. Um, as she said, right now we usually create a list of say three potential consultants, and then the applicant selects it. Which the the consultant, which to me has always felt to be a little bit. Uh, you know, one hand greasing the other. Um, what you've mentioned in 5850 is that the consultant shall be chosen by and report only to the plan to the boards, planning board or CBA. I like that. I like that a lot more. So, but I'd like to hear what other people on the board think. Hmm. Is that common, or is there is there a common way of going about it in other towns, Peggy? Um, the towns that. I'm familiar with to have this section. It's the consultant selected by the planning board or the ZBA. That seems to be that seems to be much clearer. I mean, it's always felt a little bit uh, sketchy because then the the consultant is sort of reviewing the people who select them, and oh, oh my, you know, if this is well, I, I mean the it's yeah. Um, the point is they they are paid by the applicant and you do get you know really different um estimates really different yeah well that's the applicant's <laughs> issue but well yeah i mean yeah you know the point of it being we can't let the applicant we we only send the request for proposals to people we trust um so you know, we, we have a list of 
of uh, consultants that that we feel do a good job. Um, and I, I don't know that we've ever had a pro, you know, since I've been here, I haven't seen a problem with a consultant siding with <laughs> with an applicant, if anything. No, I think, Peggy, I mean, I, I think this Rachel, and um, I think that it just often, you know, one time time bond is reviewing it and the next time, but they know each other. They've worked on other projects before. And so sometimes I think from the public's point of view, or we've seen the same consultant, but it's just the familiarity, I think, that sometimes is very jarring for a public to see that kind of, um, you know, first name usage, et cetera, et cetera. If you've seen somebody again and again. Yeah. And Peggy, you said in, in other towns, because this is the only experience I have is in this town, but in other towns, the, uh, the boards choose the consultant and they don't. They, they have don't. similar bylaws, so the boards are presumably choosing the consultant. I don't know how it works in practice. Yeah. I don't get involved in local permitting decisions. But yeah. huh. I okay. certainly would, as as Rachel was saying, Santa Lee again, um, that you know, the coziness between the applicant and the consultant that the applicant suggest uh, selected at times feels um, uncomfortable to me. <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, we've worked on two projects with, um, oh God, I remember you know, that's terrible. Well, oh, Ber Berkshire Design and Sorry. then also- um, VHB. VHB. Well, VHB is such a huge company. I mean, they've got so many different, I mean, we're working with VHB for Complete Neighborhoods. We work for VHB for um for vesh and also for sunny days and i'll tell you i love working with them because john Furman can speak so everyone understands what the heck he's talking about so you know that's sort of nice i, I don't know i mean i i personally don't have a problem with that but i mean i don't want to get to the point where i'm not trusting anybody I mean, but, I, I feel like, yeah, I just feel like people's feet were held to the fire pretty well, actually. What did the rest of the planning board think? Everyone's speaking at once. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, so this is Andrea. I'm, I mean, I'm thinking about um, how many firms are out there that we could potentially uh, be in touch with. You know, we're a small area. So maybe the, the choices are are more limited. Um, I don't know that for sure. I, I guess the, the, the change would be if you uh, request proposals from three consultants, then it's not the applicant's decision which of those three get selected. It would be the planning board or the ZBA's decision. Yeah. That would yeah, be, I mean, I mean, you could still, you would still, you know, presumably want to have, you know, qualified consultants, right? So if you're sending it out to folks that um, have good qualifications. Yeah. Um, Can I just, oh, I, I'm sorry, I just wanted to say at this point, and this may change in the future, but I send out to at least 10 because we're getting so few, everybody is so busy. I'm lucky if I get two. Right. And right. so it's sort of like at this point, I have to cast a wide net because otherwise not, you know, we're not going to have anyone to do peer review. Um, and that, well, yeah, I mean, it, it hasn't been a problem having too many proposals and that might change in the future, but it, uh, this is just like from a practical standpoint um, where we are at the moment. So I think, you know, if you get the two or three proposals in and the planning board selected a consultant and maybe they weren't, the least cost consultant. Yeah. You can see that the grounds for the appeal is limited to the minimum required qualifications. So, you know, I'm I would expect that the applicant would probably want to go with the least cost proposal, and maybe that's how they select. Whereas the planning board might want to go with a consultant that might be a little higher in cost, but they feel that they have better qualifications or 
So yeah. Yeah. I think that would be the perhaps the change from how things are working now. Yeah. Well, and it, put, it puts a lot more on the planning board. So then the planning board has to review all the applications and hopefully be able to make an educated decision on who would be the best one. Or the planner. The planner would be reviewing those and making a recommendation to us. Well, until we have a planner, that's on us. <laughs> so. yeah, this is Emily. I was going to say something along those lines that I'd like us to get to a place we're comfortable enough and then we can lean on the planner to do some of this but it feels like we need to create bylaws that are sustainable for us the planning board who are volunteer board and then when we have a hired planner like i don't think would they be doing something wrong to say like i want to review more applications for this process in the future like does that now go against the bylaws or can they just do that as part of their purview I think I, I think what you if you typically have, you know, two or three proposals come in and then you ask the applicant, you could still ask the applicant, which of these three would you, you know, sure. Yeah. Recommend, right? But then the ultimate decision would be the planning board. So if they disagreed with that. Okay. Right. And, yeah, and Denise, I can tell you, you know, with between Casey and uh, you know she's got a lot of experience and I'm feeling like I'm starting to know you know it's like we get to know who we work with so we can help you out with that you know we can use our own experience um, mm -hmm. in that. yeah so this is Andrea so I, I wonder if we should remove the line that consultant shall be chosen by and report only to Planning, well, uh, uh, the planning board is their, or their administrator. Because, wh why, Andrea? Uh, because this is, as um, Denise pointed out, this is putting um, an additional task onto the planning board that it has not been doing because the staff has been doing that. But that's what it says, and or their administrator. So you think if that's, it, and, and, okay, so it, if you think that covers it, that's okay. And are you comfortable with that, Anna Lee? Or do you want to be more involved in choosing? I think it's, uh, to me, I think it's um, from a, clen a, a clear lines of um, uh, expertise, I, I believe it should be the planning board who selects because it feels that uh the planning board is the one as as peggy was saying who is looking at i mean we certainly would take cost in consideration but we're primarily interested in what are the qualifications and if as peggy says you know we want to have input from the applicant we can have that but i'm more interested in the in the qualifications and that we're the ones who decide that yeah but, I think that makes sense. I, I think I would like to leave administrative staff in because again, we tend to have oh, yeah. a long, you know, you guys come and go, but we have experience. Like I said, Casey has yeah. a wealth of experience with the different people. So um, well, then it would be the recommendation of administrative staff with the decision at the planning board or CBA. How about in collaboration with administration? That's nice. Okay. We'll duke it out with you, Amy. Okay. <laughs> Maybe in case. You. I know. I just need to make a note of that. In my hard copy. So maybe I'll just put in collaboration with their administrator or planner or town planner. 
I think administration is fine because mm -hmm. that would be Casey okay. or Amy or the planner, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Yep. Thank you. I, yeah, I think that works. All right. Mm -hmm. So let me just uh, run through the list of changes I made, and then we'll talk about the uh, public hearing process. You know. And I, I have a couple questions too. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I had a question. Um, let's see. It is thirty-seven twenty-five, where it has performance bond. And then it says, go back to sections 3,400, 38, or 5,300. When I went back to, <laughs> I know, sorry. I saw that. I looked at that recently. Yeah, oh, those references are completely wrong. <laughs> well, no. So when I looked back at 3,400, it was driveway regulations. And I thought, I don't understand a performance bond under driveway regulations. So tell me again the section you're in, Denise. I'm on 37. I'm on 3725. It says in granting a special permit under sections 3400, 3800, or 5300, planning board shall require performance bond to ensure compliance. And so it goes back to section 3400. I thought that's driveway regulation. So I don't understand why we would have a performance bond. Well, but, you do grant a special permit under there. So just, I don't know whether um, you ever have uh, tricky driveways or common driveways where you want to make sure that they're properly built. Mm -hmm. um, but we can certainly delete the driveway section. I, the, I, I, yeah, I don't know. Sections. I just wasn't sure. Yeah. I, I, oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, I, when I looked at that, I thought, because both references seemed really odd, and I thought, is that left over from like an old numbering system and nobody updated when the numbers got changed? Yeah, well, yeah, 34, 31, and 34, 33, as you can see, don't exist. Yeah, that was. Um, so that I was went cool. searching for sections that um, required a special permit. Yeah, okay. Right. Well, that's what this okay. is referencing. Oh, okay, yeah, I'm sorry. You have updated that. Sorry, I'll shut up. That's okay. And then 50, no, 50, you know, that the, the other one made total sense, of course, which was solar. What was the other one? 5,300 so was solar, and then 5,300 is um, special permits. Is your special permit section. Right, right. Okay. Okay. So it was just the 3,400. I was confused. So do folks want to delete the driveway section? Okay. No. No? no, no, keep it. Why? why? I mean, why? Why remove it? It, it? We've had a couple of long drive driveway permits. We've like it's. We've never needed it. So, but just because well, we didn't ask for a performance bond. Bond. But did we need to? The, the, there are only two driveways that I remember since I've been on the planning board. One was for Natalie Blay. It was more. Oh no, two. There were a couple over five hundred feet. Then That's we need to have. Thinking. The special permit right. um, and we just had one yeah on like, river. no big deal so right. do you would it help if i said the planning board may require yeah that yeah that i mean decide whether or not it's yeah, may that's how fine. does that sound well it's yeah. it, you know i mean okay in the end it's probably better to leave it so if we ever have that at least we have some leverage to say it's in our bylaw so thank you rachel <laughs> okay well, when Natalie did hers, there was blasting and there was so much concern over the blasting. If you remember, it turned out much to do about mm -hmm. nothing, but God forbid that would be more. Yeah. Okay. Three, eight, nine, five, four. I had one other question. Three, eight, nine, five, four. Okay. This, why the heck did so I So just to recap, so 3725, we're leaving section 3400 in, but we're changing instead of the planning board shall require the planning board may require mm -hmm. you can exercise yeah. your judgment okay 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 peggy say the number again 35 oh 30 which one there, it's 30. uh 3725 3725 yep and it says in, yep. the proposed Thanks. language is in granting a special permit under section 3400 3800 or 5300 the planning board now will say may require a performance bond to ensure compliance with the requirements of this section. Yeah. 37, 25. Okay, 38954. 
And then after that, I just one, had one last question. And you know, we're sort of dealing with that now with Next Amp and Eversource for the um, for the landfill. I mean, or transfer station. We're going to be putting solar panels on that. So when we've been doing big projects, we've been asking for a bond. And the last one, I think, on um, on sunny days, we asked for our attorney recommended 120 percent of I think the value of what, whatever they're doing. But when we talk to, there's something in here that says something about not municipal. Where the heck is that? Is it in the solar section? What section are you in? Um, thir yeah, the solar, and it's 38954. 38. Medium scale. Financial surety, surety, I don't know how you pronounce that. Is it surety? Yes. Yep. <laughs> okay, thank you. And we have that, we have that for a different solar array um, on set right, which totally makes sense. So I did, shoot, I did ask about that. I where the heck did I put that? Yeah. Okay. I did speak because I was a little confused about that. I, sp I spoke with Carolyn today and she said, we can put that as a, um, as a condition that it goes, it's going to go back to the select board and that they need to do that. Because if you recall at, I know this is going to get a little, off, a little off base for tonight, but if you recall at our meeting, we did ask about that. And they said that they had already had a conversation with the town administration. She doesn't seem to recall that. So I guess we can take that up at the next meeting, but. What, what are, are you asking for a change in this financial surety section? No, you know, I'm sorry. I thought it had something about, there was something about municipalities that it didn't. Well, the section, the last sentence is such surety is not required for municipal facilities. Thank you. That's, that's what, yes, that's, I forgot to underline. Yes. But so I'm thinking, is that considered is that considered a municipal? It's an, it probably isn't a municipal municipal facility because we're just leasing the land. So we're the owners, we're the lessee. So it would be if the town decided to put up solar panels, that okay. would be the difference. Okay. Whereas this is this isn't the project okay. we're looking at is different. Okay, no, that's fine. I just wanted that clarification. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. So okay. the other substantive changes, um, Anna Lee had asked me to look at the sign sections and there were some discrepancies. Um, so I just uh, consolidated everything into the existing sign section, section 3200. So you'll see that there's a reference um, in the planned industrial section to go back there and it very clearly laid out. It already addressed the planned industrial um, district um, in the sign um, section. So uh, just pulled in some of the other requirements from um, the planned industrial uh, section of the zoning bylaw. So it's all collapsed in one place and uh, works. Uh, Casey had asked that the building inspector be changed to building commissioner. Um, I added a new definition for family. Hopefully folks have a chance. Could I just for a minute go back to sure. signs? Yes. I just have, I'm sorry, a question under 3221. And I think it makes sense, but it talks about in the small business district, C1, two signs or other advertising devices. And I imagine that's not too vague, but I don't know what those are. <laughs> Section 3221, other advertising. And again, maybe that's the level of vague vagueness that we want, but I don't know. What are other advertising devices? Oh. Well, it says later that no blinky lights kind of thing yeah. would be permitted. Right, which is nice. It might be those little like, um, 
sandwich. You know, the rolling, yeah, exactly. Sandwich boards or the, the little rolling gizmos that people okay. have. All right. Okay. Or uh, okay. even a, even a, like a, you know, political style signposty dealios. Okay. That's fine. I mean, I just was like, oh, I wonder what those are. Yeah, I don't know um, <laughs> what the folks had in mind when they drafted this section, but anyway, no, okay. so far. <laughs> Good. So I, I have a question that um, hasn't come up. I don't know if this is the proper time to ask it. It was about um, EV charging stations per uh, number of spots um, yeah. in the lot. Is that going forward or would it have to be, things have to be changed? I'm thinking about the school parking lots, um, even uh, tree house parking lot, one, you know, electric, vehicle charging station for every 15 spaces. That seems like a lot. I just wondered if that was a standard for some. Well, I tried to find a standard um, and um, the bylaws that I've worked on because we're a rural area doesn't really address this. And there was a request to add something. So this would be going forward for new parking lots. Um, okay. And assuming that um, EV vehicles really take off, which hopefully they will to improve yeah. quality. Um, one out of 15, I think it was, hang on just a sec. 3145, yeah. 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 Is about six to 7% of the parking lot spaces. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, should you have charging stations in all of those, well, if everyone is driving an EV car, it would be really nice if there were more than just one lonely EV charging station in a big parking lot. So I don't know, there weren't any like, you should have at least 6%, you know, or you should have 25% because 25% of the vehicles driving around will, you know, be electric vehicles. There yeah. wasn't that type of guidance. Um, so, uh, so I'm wondering about the, the Leary lot, for example. I, I mean, don't we have two charging stations now uh, installed and the, the lot is not yet? I think they're adding, out. aren't they adding some? Yeah, they're, they're looking at, I, I know the last discussion I heard was um, 1.5 or 1, 1, 1. 1.5 was, I don't know, whatever. Uh, 1.5 for 15 or something like that. Or, I thought it was less. I mean, they were trying to, I don't know. Do you remember Andrea? No, what? I don't. So, so the, the question is, do we, do we say for new parking areas? I mean, I just wonder if people will look at that and wonder if that has to be um, inst you know, instituted now in we, existing. We can't, we can't, I don't think we have the power to go back and tell people that they need to add that to their parking <laughs> lots. That's pre-existing non-conforming. Okay. Yeah. A, a grandfathered. You can't hold somebody responsible for previous right. building based on current yeah. new requirements. Yeah. Okay. So, and you don't think that it's necessary to add new for new parking areas? Well, if you had a re redevelopment, so say you had a vacant property and there was a parking lot there, and now there was a new, presumably you would want that new development to put in these EV charging stations. So I don't yeah. know if you want to say, in addition, new parking areas should include. I think, mm -hmm. you know, this is kicking in for um, new development or redevelopment of areas. So. Well, that's exactly. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly what the Leary lot is. That is an existing parking lot. And now it's gonna be turned into a real parking lot. And so we do have EV chargers. And Danilee, I don't recall how many, but I thought they were putting in more. But the, the meeting to, is tonight, right now, when we're having our meeting, so. Oh. Yeah. But I assume you would want, yeah, I went to in, it. That, in that case, you've got a new <laughs> use, right? And a, a redone parking lot, you know, hopefully landscaping is being added if it's yes. a huge yeah. of asphalt. <laughs> no, um, it is, it is. Right. Yeah, there's like there's a whole landscape plan. Once again, Berkshire design. <laughs> but 
okay. really working with them. So, Andrea, are you okay with I am roughly six percent? Yes, my uh, my concern was just that people would look at this and think, oh dear, now I have to add um, uh, EV chargers. But if that's not the case, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, I think this is applying to new uses and redevelopment. Okay. Okay. Um, so I did add a new definition for family and we talked about increasing the a number of units allowed for multifamily up to four. Um, so I added that. Um, I pulled in the new accessory apartment section that got approved by town meeting and updated the use regulation schedule. And also there's actually, you can see right here in parking, there was a three spaces for a single family with an accessory apartment. So I changed that. I added the pharmacies that we talked about with or without a drive-through window, the EV we just talked about, and then hopefully, um, uh, you took a closer look at the new official zoning map. And uh, the one change that was requested the last meeting was to change it from historic Deerfield to old Deerfield. So it wasn't confused with the organizations, one of the organizations in, in Deerfield. So those are the, the major changes. So are there any other things that folks would like to go over? Well, just one last one last thing, sure. <laughs> and I, I know there's there's definitely you know a, a concern about and I sent I did send that out to everyone. I don't know if you guys had a chance to look, so I just did it today. But you know the whole thing when we did when we did um, the contract or whatever with um, Treehouse and people were re really concerned about the hotel part, and I think the intention was not to have a big hotel, but Maybe, maybe a smaller boutique, which I don't think is going to happen anyway. But I did, once again, I spoke with Carolyn today about that. And, um, you know, we don't want things to be so restrictive, but she was, she was talking about boutique hotels. So I sent you, I looked up and I sent a couple different definitions of boutique hotels. And typically they're between 10 and 100 rooms. Of course, we could make it however many rooms we wanted to. And it's, you know, it's, it's not like Ramada Inn, it's much smaller. And that's, I think that's something that would probably fit in with the town a little bit better than a big Ramada Inn or whatever. You know, another, what's that thing down there? The red, red roof, which yeah, is I mean, just, like the Wheatley Inn would count as a boutique yeah, hotel. Yeah, yeah. I mean, red roof is just is one more, one problem after another, you know, the type of, Unfortunately, the type of place that it is, we've had a lot of um, drug related issues there over the years, but at any rate, so we've got this, you know, it's, um, you know, differs, it's a, it's a hotel, a smaller upscale luxury hotel, it doesn't have to be a luxury hotel, but it's, it's just that we're differentiating it from a large chain hotel. Plus the chain oh. hotels, we don't have room for them anyway. So this is uh, in the tourism overlay district section. It, it, yeah. Four nine five four uses rather than just saying hotels. It would say boutique hotels, and then you would add a definition for boutique hotels. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what others think, but I think that that would that would probably um, put a lot of people at ease with a a more uh, more defined, you know, a better definition than just a hotel, because we don't know what that means. I like that idea. I think it also would protect us in the future, potentially, if we wanted to pass something like that. Yeah, I mean, we don't want to eliminate it. We want we don't want to make it so restrictive that people, you know, I mean, people say, well, you know, what about our taxes? Well, you know, we we want to have things that you know people that pay taxes, but we don't want something that is not going to once again fit in with the character of the town. Yes, and remember, so, this, these are by right uses, so you don't have any review. There's no review going on, so 
right having addressing the scale issue i think would be important mm -hmm. i'm just looking so, right now um where your hotel i mean i just looked up quickly you know definition of boutique hotel yeah I was just we get... in your existing use table where where you address it. oh okay is there a risk of us getting slammed the other direction with like being against big business or NIMBY? Is, like, is there like another, I just want to think through the lens. Will people get mad at us for saying we don't want a certain type of business in our town? Well, that's why I was looking at your use table and I'm honestly, I'm not seeing hotels in here, which is kind of odd. Wait, which okay, where where are you, Peggy? So I'm in I'm in looking at your use table, 2200. Oh. Okay. Right? okay. To see where hotels because I think the response would be, well, if they don't fit in this boutique category, they can still come in for a special permit or site plan review. But I'm trying to look down the list and find hotels and I'm not finding it right away. Hmm. In which case we should add it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's there. I yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's not, it's, you know, I, I know you brought that up last time and I yeah, and you know it's a potential issue. Does anyone else see where I'm I'm looking in C commercial for hotels? Am I just missing it? Because it's late. <laughs> oh, God. I feel like I'm seeing it too in my brain and now I can't find it. So I, I'm noticing for in the parking space area, it talks about inns and bed, bed and breakfast. So an inn rather than a hotel. Um, so usually you would have different de definitions. So inns are often classified as historic structures. Mm. Um, and then yeah, but hotels are, um, Oh, a specific definition. Okay, and so hotels often have de definitions too. So we could add. So it's up forty nine fifty four. And by right uses in the um, within yes. the um, and it's number four. Yes, but uh, right now I'm looking in your use table to see. Right. But so I think that's the only, I don't think we have it other than that spot. So we should add it to your use table. Correct. That's, and I think that's where Denise is pointing to that that's a whole, that, that this whole, this is where that bylaw kind of got plucked in. And we're, this is a good yep. um, clarification. Oh. For us. Yep. All right. So I'll add hotels. And do you want me to add ins? Yes, hotels well, are ins. And then the question is, do you also want motels? I'm sorry. Also, what motels? Motels. Yeah. No. No. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to add well, hotels and ins. Anna Lee. You know <laughs> so, but it, this is by right. So this is this well, goes. No, back no, to no, no, no. The TOD might be by right. In your zoning bylaws in your use table, I would not recommend any having by right hotels. Oh, agreed. Agreed. So why in 49? I see this is under this is under the tourist. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. You know, what? I see TOD, I think town of Deerfield. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so, sorry. so sorry, sorry, sorry. So Peggy, there's an ordinance. I, oh God, when I was 21 years old, I lived out in Palm Springs, California for, I don't know, like half a year or something. They had an ordinance ordinance that you could not have any motels. So they named it a hotel, even though it was a motel. So that some, that's how they got around it, but it was still the same, you know, basic motel six. So yeah. I don't, I, I don't want to leave any window open for that. I think what we can do is have a line of motel and have a definition and say, no, no, yeah. no, I guess. Yeah. All right. That would be good. All right. Are you can doing I something in the hotel that you don't want people to do in Deerfield, Denise? Um, possibly. 
<laughs> but you would have a special permit process. So you could have a hotel and you might yeah. have a chain, but you would just have a review of it and make the decision rather than allowing it by right. Wait, okay. The bylaw that we just did a couple of years ago and shoot, what's it called? Oh, that's oh, the terrible. franchise bylaw? Yes. Did that include hotels? So you can't have any that have more than three someplace. Oh, form based. So it's form, not those formula based. Form, yeah, form, and it didn't say you couldn't have them. It just meant that it, it, you, you, if you go back. Right. It's not, they're not barred. They're just asked to work better with the community. Right. Well, but it you couldn't have more than three. For instance, you couldn't have a Ramada Inn or a Holiday Inn because they have more than three, um, three hotels. Oh, each of them, right? Each of them. So it 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 uh, <laughs> narrows the scope down to ones that are more, um, you know, just independent. I don't know. Well, you could you could have one Ramada Inn or one Holiday Inn Express, right? Right. No, Under your franchise. You couldn't have any. No. Um, well, with formula based business, it primarily addresses the external appearance. Yep. And that um, has to do with um, any what is it? Any business that has more than um, five or six at all in their it franchise. Was, it, was, it was three. Uh, yeah, I can't remember. OK. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So I don't know, you know, that gets tricky too, because that's a franchise, but yeah, if it's still a Ramada Inn, it doesn't matter that it's a franchise. There's still more than three Ramada Inns in the world. I mean, it, it was an attempt to, you know, probably not have uh, places like Dollar General. No, and, it was, a, yeah, or attempt, not necessarily not to have them, but have more control over what they look like. More control and, and also where they're located too. Okay, so, well, let's talk yeah. about where you want hotels, yeah. inns, and motels. I assume hotels and inns are okay in your C1 and C2 district by special permit? I sure. think so. Yeah. Annalise, do you still have a question or your hand's still up? Excuse me, I have a question with tourism overlay, so when you have a chance. Okay. And then motels were saying no. Yes? Correct. Okay. All right. So just to reiterate, hotels and inns might be allowed by special permit in the C1 and C2 district, and motels not in any district. Okay. Annalie? Um, yeah. Um, we have a note from Peggy saying that um, as far as tourism overlay district is concerned, planning board might want to talk with the select board about some legal concerns that members of the community have raised. And um, there was a conversation with the select board, I don't know, you know, probably a year ago. Um, and the consensus at that point with the select board is that they they didn't want to do anything with the with the tourism overlay district because it hadn't been used yet. The, the crux of the matter is that the people who raised the concerns felt that in fact, the town was sort of in uh, a difficult position legally. And I can't remember why. Um, and so we wouldn't want to wait until there's someone else who is mm -hmm. testing that bylaw. It seems to me that the first thing we should do is have our legal consultant review, I don't know, the questions that were raised and look again at the tourism overlay district bylaws and see if there's any reason to make any change. I, again, it was so long ago, I can't recall, except the, the questions that were, con, were raised were fairly specific. I sent them to Peggy. I don't know, Denise, if I've sent them to you or not. I've, but in any event, I think it would be at this point, we did have, you know, a year ago, we had a conversation with select board and they said, no, you know, let's wait until somebody tries to do something with it. I, in my yeah. recollection, Annalie, was that was when Jennifer Gannett was here. I, I don't remember the select board saying that, but, you well, know, I think, I think. Well, what, what, 
Trevor. Yeah. Oh, well, I don't know. Once again, that came in because um, that started the whole conversation because of this, because of Treehouse and, you know, putting that in that they could potentially have. And I think they thought about maybe having a small boutique place, you know, people coming to concerts, they'd have a place to stay overnight. And once again, you know, I had that conversation with Carolyn today, said, hey, what about? And, you know, it was just the intent was not to open it up to big hotels. So I think tonight, I think it's a good conversation. We are defining what it means. So I, I, I think I'd like to go a little farther than just hotels in C1 and C2 and have a, a more specific definition. Well, let me send you again, whatever the concerns were, because again, I can't remember them, but it might yep. be something worth looking at talking with people online or offline. Well, and also, you know, I did say that we wanted to um, have a joint meeting with the planning board and the select board on these, because that's what, you know, we talked about last time. So I did mention that today. So I just want to make sure that we have all the points that we want to talk about for the select board. And again, I talked to Peggy about before the meeting started and um, I know she's dying to come to that meeting. So <laughs> maybe we can have it a little earlier than normal um, just as a part of this a select board meeting. And if we can, you know, have, have the questions that we want to talk about the tourism overlay. Okay. Um, I'll find out the definition of nonprofit you know, prior to that. And I don't know what else. That's yeah, all I have. So my it. suggestion was, you know, that the buy right uses are also not subject to any of the performance standards. And I think everyone should probably, if, if they're being allowed by right with no special permit or, or site plan review, then thinking about whether or not there should be some performance standards that may not be exactly the ones for the manufacturing processing, but you know, you've know you got some key concerns or traffic generation, hours of operation and or hazardous material, and all those performance standards don't apply to this whole list of buy right uses in the TOD. And so I was just suggesting that folks go back and think about that carefully. So even if you're going to allow by right, should you also be thinking about some performance standards? Right. That seems really smart. <laughs> and I would also look at the list of by right uses again and think whether or not a special permit or site plan review might be advisable. So even a boutique hotel, if it's got 100 rooms or however you de define it, it's going to have presumably traffic impact. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so yeah. anyhow, I think it's worth having that discussion with the select mm -hmm. board. Yeah. Um, I agree. <coughs> I mean, it, it basically has, it has the same kind of impact, um, the same thing I was looking at for, um, for the retail establishments. I mean, the, you know, the same kind of questions. You know how much of an impact and traffic impact will it, will it have? Right. But it's, it's and the nuts. commercial recreation is pretty broadly defined. Yes. So I don't know if there are some commercial recreation uses that people might not be excited about mm -hmm. that are now allowed by right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Ross, here we come. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, I think unless there are other questions, we've covered everything that I wanted to cover. And the last thing is um, next steps are you all meeting with the select board and hopefully I can join that, that to talk about the TOD and maybe making some adjustments. And then I have some changes um, to make uh, for kind of a the next draft, which I would hope we could call the public information session draft. So um, 
at least yeah. a lot of the communities I work with, rather than going right to the public hearing, which, you know, there's all kinds of legal notices and expenses associated with that, to have a public information session so people can come and look at what's being proposed and have input um, um, and see if the, if, uh, the general consensus is that um, they like what the planning board is uh, proposing and, and things are on mm -hmm. the right track or whether there's problems that you okay. all should know about <laughs> before you get to the public hearing. Yeah. Yes? That's good. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I can check with, um, I'll check with, I don't know, with Chris, with Casey, whomever, and the select board as to when we could be put, because it would make sense just to tag on to a select board agenda. Does that make sense? Yes, with, I think so. Okay. So <laughs> let me check with them. They can, I just, have, can I just okay. say one, one thing too? I think that we might, Pat, Peggy, I'm sorry, but we might seg, uh, like, I think the tourism overlay district is a big, that's a big chunk. And I, I'm concerned that we, we've just made a lot of great changes. And I don't know, is it kind of wish it was the other way around, but do we want to separate these two or does it just well, make sense to do it all at once? I don't know. Can I think. I I think, Rachel, I was already thinking about separating it so you would present kind of the housekeeping stuff. Right. Which is, okay. you know, changes and the okay, out hiring of outside consultants. And then yep. you would have the floodplain overlay district bylaw because there were significant changes there. Yeah. The conservation subdivisions. So we could have the TOD as a separate mm -hmm. change. Okay, good. Good. Okay. So that if that was getting too controversial. Yeah. Right. You could just decide that that wasn't worth pursuing right now. So I would think that you would probably have several warrant articles, one for what I'm gonna call housekeeping, you yeah. know, wrong numbers, right. you know. Definitions. Definitions, you know, uses, those right. things. And then yeah. any section that had major changes like the conservation subdivision design yep. and the floodplain overlay, that those would be separate warrant That's articles. Got it. Got it. Good. Good. Thank you. That that helps a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So if the TOD thing, if the select board's not supportive of changes, um, or you know maybe that's just minimal changes like adding the boutique hotel mm -hmm. and adding a definition there, um, but I think I think it's worth having the discussion about, you know, what what exactly is in the buy right use list. Yes, And even if you don't want to require a special permit or site plan review, do you want to have some performance standards that apply to it? Mm -hmm. Right. It seems also that the density of this work is just huge. And so being able to compartmentalize different aspects of it for the public, all of us, is a little bit more digestible. And what is almost standard status quo in multiple communities versus really some of the things that are super specific to Deerfield, especially the tourist overlay district, that by right is huge, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll check and see select board meetings. I for, hey, Amy, when are the select board meetings? I know they're Wednesdays. I forget which dates. They seem to have a lot of them. Amy's oh boy, you know, I don't know because I'm never involved in them, so I don't uh, okay. I'm not yeah. sure which which it's typically what is it the first or the second or I, I don't remember. Um I'll check with I'll check. Okay. To and, see. And you should when, find out if they have a really busy agenda, they may want to have this as a separate right. I'll ask together. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I'll, ch yeah. I'll check with I'll check with Carolyn because she's the chair now. I'll check with her tomorrow on that, and then um, yeah, if she thinks it's crazy, then we'll just you know. You can I'll, also I'll, just hold off on it and just you know kind of have an internal discussion of what you'd like to recommend to the select board and take it up at a later date. That's true. If they're too busy. And you're yeah, well, you know, worried, it's, if it's, you're worried, you know, because sometimes, as I think folks have pointed out, if something is uh, 
Yeah. That might be difficult to get through if, mm -hmm. you know, they may, it may make the other zoning changes, you know, more difficult to get through. So right. I'll, I'll check with them. I know it's been a little busy at town hall because there have been some people out for various reasons. So um, I'll check on that. All right. And then, um, yeah. And then I'll also, I'll get answers for, you know, the nonprofit article. And there are some things that you pointed out in, in so I'll, I'll get answers to some of the other questions. Great. But and in the meantime. In terms of the public information session, I would expect that you wanted to hold that in like early September. August isn't the best month. Yeah. Yeah. For getting attendance. Um, so maybe you can, we can pick a yeah. date to hold for that. Sure. It could be part of a regular planning board meeting or okay. a separate, yeah. separate meeting. Okay. Okay. Depending on what you'd like to do. Okay, that sounds good. Um, shoot, what else? I was going to say something else. I don't remember. I don't know. Right. Yeah, I can't think. I thought went right out of my head. Okay. Oh, okay. No. So, okay. Before, before we have that meeting with the select board again, if everyone can go back and read this first, so we have our own questions. So we're all prepared for that meeting. And I'll speak with Carolyn tomorrow and see if we can get on the agenda. And I'll just, if we can, then um, I'll send out the dates and hopefully everyone would be able to attend. If they do it in, you know, as a regular meeting, they may be able to do it a little earlier, you know, it could be a separate meeting. So we'll yeah, figure I that see, out. Yeah, I'm looking. I think, oh, select board, well, July 18th, obviously. And I see one for Wednesday, July 26th. Okay. Well, all right. July 18th, that's tomorrow. That's a little early. Yeah, that's, that's out. <laughs> that's not Maybe July 26th. I don't, well, okay. Right now, let's take a poll. July 26th, would people be able to attend? No. Okay. No. Annalie, you're out of town. I know that. I can't. Let me, before I speak, let me check. <laughs> I am like solidly confident I could be there. Or okay. Than, you know. I, I can be there. Rachel. Also, thumbs up from Rachel. Thumbs down from Kathy. Yeah, I won't be able to be there. The 26th and 27th is tricky. Well, if it's Denise, Rachel, and myself, what about Andrea's checking? I mean, that's three. We need four. Need yeah, four. I can. Uh, oh, yes, I can. Kathy Sylvester. And I can do the 26th. Okay. So that's yeah. at least four of us and maybe five with Kathy, Kathy Sylvester. Oh, wait. So wait. I'm sorry. So who's the four? Andrea. Adelaide, Denise, Andrea, Rachel. Andrea, Rachel. That, that's three. And you. Hmm? Emily, Andrea, Emily. Rachel, Denise. Oh, God. I'm sorry, Emily. Jeez. Did you forget about me again? I'm so sorry. Hey, yeah. Wow. It's been a long, long day. It's like long they're day. regular. Okay. Well, this is only if they can do it. This if they can do it. This if they can for sure. If they can't, <laughs> I'll send out a text or an email asking you about another date. Right. And, and it might even, even be worth just doing it for a quick meeting too so nobody needs to be there for a long time just to get this on their radar because yeah. i'm sure that that's not yeah and yeah. to find out whether their support right. exactly. yeah. changes or if it, this is okay. a non-starter so i'll check tomorrow i'll see if it's possible if it's possible i'll send an email out to all of you and say be prepared to ask questions and uh we'll do it and if not we'll do it another time Sounds good. All right. Okay. So let's see. Um, is there anything else? Hey, Rachel, I'm sorry. Just one last thing. You said at our planning board meeting last week, you said, oh, that could we, that could be real quick. We could talk about it. I have no idea what it was. <laughs> and if you can't remember, I'm not going to. My brain is gone. Uh, okay. It's, it's, I've turned into a pumpkin. 
Well, I think we all have. All right. But so I would you... I would motion to adjourn if that was oh, you think I anyway. knew you were gonna do that. <laughs> okay. Hey, that's my job. And do I'm doing every it. Second. Okay. Thank you, Annalie. Second. Okay. I'm to take a vote. Andrea? Yes. Kathy Utrova? Yes. Rachel? Yes. Emily? Yes. yes. Annalie? Yes. yes. Denise, yes. Okay. Peggy. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, okay. Peggy. Yes. Thank, thank you, Peggy. It was great. Okay. Thank you. Really appreciate it.